Good morning, everybody. How we doing today? It's a little bit dark in here. Let's lighten it up. Let's praise Jesus.
to act justly and show mercy to our humbly with our God. Cause this is who you are. Oh, oh, oh. 
We thank you, Jesus. And I ask this morning, Lord, that you would just put your hand on those folks here, those who are coming to bring your message, those who are proclaiming your name, those who are hurting. praise team for the great job they do. Um, the song, yeah. um, the, the songs they choose help set a tone, kind of the right attitude, help us to see who Jesus is and who we are in relationship to him. And it helps me just to humble myself before God. And I think that's how we're supposed to come to God. Um, William Law once said, humility is nothing else but a right judgment of ourselves. And one of the songs that we sing, it says, who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Free at last, he has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. You see, we're to come to the Lord humbly, just like our Savior, Jesus. He had that attitude of humility. And in second... In, in Philippians 2, it says that we should have the same mindset as Jesus, who, being very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Today, we come to honor Jesus, the one who humbled himself and took on our sins at the cross. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, <clears throat> We thank you so much for loving us and for sending your son, Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, for becoming a servant, humbling yourself, and taking away our sins by your death on the cross. We pray, Lord, that as we partake of these emblems, we would remember that special sacrifice for us and that one day we'll come to be with you again in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. And you have emblems in front of you. If you would, open them and we'll partake together. <coughs> Do 
we do this in remembrance of Jesus. at this time we come to remember how God has blessed us so much during the week and we come to honor him and return back a portion of what he's blessed us with and there's a box in the back you can drop your gifts and offerings in later <coughs> dear heavenly father we come to you acknowledging how wonderful you are and how how much you bless us how much you love us and bless us so so wonderfully and right now lord as we bring back to you a portion we ask that it would honor you and please you and may it help others to know about that love and and how much you love the whole world and we ask, Father, that you would just be with each one of us and help us to realize daily the blessings you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you didn't realize it, uh, Mark and Mary and the family are away today, and we have a special guest speaker. He was born in Daytona Beach and went to, uh, was a member of South Daytona Christian. And he went to uh, Atlanta, Atlanta Christian College, and um, graduated there, and then went on to get a PhD. And he's had um, several um, ministries, preaching ministries, and he also, um, taught at the college Johnson University for 11 years and he is now um, an elder at McIntosh Christian Church or yes yes okay yes okay okay and he also has three children and eight grandchildren so if you would Please welcome Bob Ritchie. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. One Bob to another. <laughs> <laughs> Can't have too many Bobs. <laughs> it's good to be here. Thank you. Um, my wife is not feeling well, or she usually travels with me when I have speaking engagements. So, uh, so I uh, uh, am glad to be here by myself. Anyway to be able to um, share the, the Word of God with you. Yeah, I grew up in Daytona Beach and um, not unfamiliar at all with DeLand because uh, my brother went to Stetson and uh, many, many years ago. And uh, so we come over every now and then. We had a Christmas routine for a while where I met, where we met my grandmother in, uh, in DeLand. And some of you may have to get in your time machine. You may know about this, you may not. But there used to be a store called Neisner's. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, we got at least one. And, uh, yeah, and that's where we met, believe it or not. Did some Christmas shopping, had some hot chocolate, and, and that kind of thing. So I got, I got some good memories around here and everything. Um, you know, in American culture, there are a lot of choices, aren't there? And we as Christians want to try to figure out, <laughs> what does God want us to do? Um, it would be nice. I don't know if it'd be nice. It might be a little bit scary. But what, what if every time you had a decision to make, God, um, you know, put a handwriting on the wall? Oh, oh, I was wondering. Yeah. 
light in here. Ah, there we go. A little jewel here. Take off the lid or turn it on at the top. Yeah. At the top? Yeah. Success? Ho! Oh. <laughs> All right. Now you don't want me to repeat everything I've repeated so far. At least at least the front row has probably heard what I said. <laughs> so, so we'll just continue on then. All right, so, um, yeah, well, trying to figure out what God wants us to do, that's a pretty important thing, I think, for Christians. Um, but, you know, there are so many options in life. How in the world do you choose? Uh, one of the most common uh, oh, examples of choosing, I suppose, is like, you know, you go into your Walmart and you want to get a tube of toothpaste. Well, there are, you know, what, um, seven different sizes of tubes? And, you know, another dozen different brands and all the kinds of different prices. So <laughs> if, you, if you felt like you really didn't have, you know, any freedom about this thing and you had to get the exact tube of toothpaste, that could be very intimidating, couldn't it? Well, you know, you go into a, a restaurant and um, some of them have these really almost exhaustive, and that's a good word to use because it makes you almost exhausted to read them what's on there, you know, unless you already know what you want. So do you want to really read like 15 pages worth of, uh, of food lists? Maybe, I don't know. So the, um, the waiter comes up to me and he says, what would you like to drink? I say, just water. Bottled or tap? Tap will be fine. Served in a plastic, paper, styrofoam, or glass cup. <laughs> glass, please. Small, medium, large, or supersize? Medium. With or without ice? Ice would be nice. Ice pellets, crushed or cubed? <laughs> pellets. Would you uh, care for a wedge of lemon or lime with your water? Lime. Would that be California lime or Florida key lime? Florida key lime. Excellent. Would you like it anything else? By that time, probably not. I'm pretty much exhausted just trying to go through that. I think you probably have a pretty good idea that didn't actually happen. But, uh, it, I'm trying to give an over-the-top example about we got so many choices in, in life. Um, of course, we as Christians, we who are Christians, are, are convinced that we want to try to do what, what God wants us to do and make choices along those lines. Um, so... But, but but we still have to ask that question. I mean, what does God want me to do? How can we know that thus and such is God's will for me? Now, I hope you're not too worried about having, like, the last and final and, and absolute complete answer about figuring out what the will of God is. But I think I've got some helps that come from Scripture um, one direct scripture that we're going to read in a few minutes from James, the first chapter, and, and then just some other inferences maybe from that, and, and then some other scriptures as well where we kind of can put some of this together to help us out. So let's read James 1, verses 1 through 8. This is from the uh, New International Version. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. Seriously? <laughs> yes, seriously. Okay. We'll try to figure out how, how that could be possible, right? Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If anyone, If any of you lacks wisdom... He should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord, because uh, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. So with a lot of... Uh, questions we have in life trying to figure out what is God's will. I do think that for probably the vast majority of uh, decisions that we make, um, we, we don't necessarily agonize over them. And I'm not sure we need to. For example, you know, you talk, what socks do I wear this morning? Uh, I'll wear black socks. You know, I, I think we're all pretty calm and collected about something along those lines. 
I, I don't think we feel like, you know, you have to figure out, God really wants you to wear those green ones. And for some reason, I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case. Maybe on St. Patrick's Day. But other than that, perhaps not. Um, but, but, you know, some concerns, and this is kind of where we're going with it. Some questions in life, when we're trying to figure out what God's will is, are way more serious than something like the socks that you wear. For example, college. Which one? Graduate school? Um, night school, perhaps? Or maybe just do some online and, and you don't necessarily move away? Uh, who should I marry? That's kind of a biggie. <laughs> um, before that, it'd probably be good to ask, well, you know, who should I get to know? Um, if we progress so far in our relationship with each other, is it time to go deeper? Or is there a sort of a, maybe a, a cutoff time, and we say that, okay, you know, it's, uh, maybe I should not go deeper according to the will of God. What should I do for a living? Uh, do I follow a job and relocate? Uh, rent, buy a house, uh, what should be the maximum amount to offer on a given house, how much should I pay, and all those kind of things. Um, with what church should I become involved? What criteria should I use for deciding the answer? That's a big one, okay? How should I serve God in my home, on the job, through my job, in the church? Um, spiritual giftedness, how do I, you know, kind of figure out what that is? Um, and, and go with that, with God's will there. How about when we get older? <laughs> um, what kind of health coverage should I get? Do I, do I need regular uh, assistance for daily living? Do I need to <coughs> relocate in a retirement or assisted living facility of some kind? And if so, which one? Should I go, maybe, and, and live closer to where my kids are, or grandkids are? So there are all kinds of questions that we have about some fairly serious issues in life, I would suggest. And I, you know, I've just scratched the surface of the large questions that we, sh we should ask, or could ask. Uh, there are a lot of medium-sized questions, and certainly there are a lot of small ones um, that are out there as well. So here's what I want to do. Um, I want to offer some observations and what I hope are some aids to discerning what the will of God is. And again, some of these come directly from our text. Some of these come by uh, inference and uh, some from <coughs> elsewhere in the Bible. First of all, oh, I don't want to scare you too much, but I'm just going to tell you up front. This is a nine-point sermon. <laughs> but the points are pretty brief. So I think it'll work out to the traditional three-point sermon uh, when, it, when it comes to the chronology of the thing. So I don't think you have to worry too much. All right. Number one, keep asking God for wisdom. Keep asking God for wisdom. Don't think that God's going to give us like a one-time injection and, <laughs> of wisdom and, and we'll be good for the rest of our lives. That would be great. I would that he did. But I just don't believe that's the way it is. Now, look, God, I asked you for wisdom back in 2003. You gave it to me. <laughs> and that's why I've never asked for another word, uh, you know, about having some more wisdom. It's almost as reasonable as me saying to my wife, Sandra, you know, hey, you know, I told you I loved you back in 1975 when we got married. <laughs> and then I'd let you know if anything changed. Since then. Uh, no, not a good idea. Some things bear repeating. And uh, we need to keep coming to God for requests for wisdom as the circumstances warrant it. And, you know, Jesus gives us all kinds of, of examples just by way of reminder that, uh, you know, to be kind of persistent in prayer. Um, God doesn't automatically dispense wisdom a once-for-all sort of deal. Um, nor is it automatic that the church, to use it in sort of the broadest sense and historical sense, or we as individuals um, always get things right and don't need more wisdom to kind of, you know, turn around and get things going back in the right direction again. In fact, we have the example of what were some pretty strong churches at one time in the uh, churches of Asia Minor that are in the first three chapters or so of the book of Revelation. And some of them were kind of wandering. A couple of them were doing pretty good. Philadelphia is one of the ones that was doing pretty good. But, but some of them were really kind of wandering around. And, and so uh, they, they needed some renewed wisdom, let's just say. And Jesus was fairly direct about that, if you, if you uh, remember that. 
All right, secondly, God doesn't usually reveal his will in miraculous handwriting on the wall. I am not saying he doesn't. <laughs> Last thing I would want to do is to limit what God chooses to do or doesn't choose to do. Nevertheless, it certainly doesn't appear that that is the way that God usually conducts his uh, answers when we uh, ask him about wisdom. In other words, God usually uses less <coughs> spectacular means to convey his purposes for us. And that's one of the reasons that we need to keep being in the Bible um, in order to uh, discern what God's will is. Sometimes God uses friends, fellow church members, to help us out in that uh, regard as well, to give us some wisdom. Um, contemporary Christian authors, if we you know, want to keep comparing with the scriptures, but some of those can be quite helpful and provide some insights. God can even use family members in order to convey some wisdom to us. Even a spouse can convey, theoretically, and in reality, don't tell Sandra I said the theoretically thing, that can convey the wisdom of God to us if we're willing to uh, listen. All right, listening to someone else is kind of a segue to the next point here. Number three. Be humble. Be willing to go outside of yourself to seek wisdom. Now, think of how, uh, at least those of you that are, you know, maybe got a little age on you. Uh, th think of how you changed already over the years. But realize that more change perhaps is in order. That we are maturing. I like what Peter said, although it's kind of challenging for us, I suppose, but at the end of his second letter, he said, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the original language, it's be growing. It's, a, it's like a, a continuous commandment. It's a, it's a present imperative. It just means to keep doing it. Keep growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So there certainly is always room for us to, uh, to grow. And we need to have that sort of humility to... To, to be willing to receive um, the message that God gives us and to, to, do, uh, to say, okay, I didn't see this coming, Lord, but if this is what you want me to do, I, I will go with this. It's, it's your will. Um, I, I did get my uh, PhD up in the Chicago area, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and that was kind of a big surprise. Not that I got it, <laughs> but... But that it certainly seemed, again, not a handwriting on the wall. But I was looking at like maybe five options of different places around the country that I might want to pursue for that. And, it, you know, Chicago was the last one on the list. <laughs> but it ended up being a really blessed experience um, going up there. Wonderful people, um, relatively conservative, uh, evangel broadly evangelical people at the school there who were teaching and everything. And folks, that can make a pretty big difference um, about the schools that are chosen. I just would suggest prep your kids. <laughs> uh, be really and, and be aware, be informed about where where they're going. Make sure they connect with some something like a, a Christian campus house. Um, and I think most of the certainly the larger and probably a lot of the medium sized universities have those kind of things. I know the University of Florida does because I'm on the board of directors for the. University of Florida Christian Campus House with, with Bob and Celeste Gailey there. Do it and they do a wonderful job. Um, but they're probably going to need some support. Um, there are academia nuts out there. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm certainly not anti intellectual by any means because I myself, it, I guess, it, it's, am one of those um, nuts. But, um, they, they can make things sound very plausible. They, they know the large words. They know the concepts. They're, they're very well educated as far as being exposed to so much. And, and yet, um, that can almost overwhelm the incoming students uh, about, uh, well, this, you know, this faith business can't. I mean, it's really a questionable thing. You know, the Bible, are you serious? Being accurate? Okay. Yeah, it actually is. <laughs> and there are a lot of good reasons, but they're not going to tell you the good reasons because they're not believers. I'm sure there are exceptions, okay? And I just simply want to note that. I'm not trying to be unkind. But um, kids often do lose their faith 
uh, when they when they go to um, schools uh, beyond high school. So I just want to give you a heads up. You may already have thought about that. Let's continue. Um, unless you're absolutely certain to be willing to revisit an issue, especially if circumstances change. Bob Russell gave a good example of this in one of his books a while ago. He said, you know, we tried a youth choir at our church, the Southeast Christian Church up in Kentucky. And um, it kind of faded and fizzled after a while. And so we just, we just decided, okay, we're going to drop it. And then, you know, like a couple years later or whatever, they tried it again, and it just went like guns blazing. It <laughs> did really well. And so I guess, you know, with some things, it's, it's, it is a matter of timing sometimes. Do I buy the car now, or do I buy it later? Do you get the house now, um, or do you get it later? Those are, those are some things to, uh, to consider when we're trying to uh, seek the wisdom of God. There's something that could be pretty confusing. I don't think it has to be in the Scripture. But you may remember that the Apostle Paul um, <coughs> circumcised, had Timothy circumcised. Okay? And that's recorded in Acts 16, 1 through 3, which we're not going to read now, but I just want to give you the reference. But he refused to have Titus circumcised. That was in Galatians 2, 1 through 5. The circumstances were different. I'm not always saying, you know, I'm not a situation ethics kind of guy, but sometimes circumstances certainly can make a difference. And they did here. With Timothy, it was so he could help bring others to Christ, okay? But with Titus, the crowd that was paying attention to Titus and Paul at that time were saying, you have to be circumcised or you can't be saved. You've got to be circumcised to be a Christian. And so Paul said, no, we're not going to circumcise Timothy when all the people are thinking that kind. All right, um, number five, just because you feel good about a decision, that doesn't mean it's God's will. Uh, feelings, oh, feelings. <laughs> There's an old song, pretty corny, but it was in my era. That just, the whole song is talking about feelings, right? Okay. Well, feelings are a gift of God. They're wonderful things. But man, they sure can lead us astray. We've got to have more than just feelings governing us. It becomes just rampant um, subjectiv uh, subject subjectivity, subjectivism, if we just go with feelings alone. My eye. Paul himself is the uh, poster child for that kind of thing. He was utterly convinced. He tells us so in 1 Timothy 1, 12 and 13. He was utterly convinced. He did everything in good conscience. When he went after Christians, had them incarcerated, and sometimes had them killed for their faith. He was completely convinced. His feelings, his conscience, everything told him that that was the right thing to do, and he was absolutely wrong. So we got to stick to the standard where we can tell what is right or wrong. And that certainly is the, uh, the scriptures here. Um, God had mercy on him. It was kind of a mitigating factor for Paul that, that God didn't just, like, you know, move him out of his presence permanently. But the Bible tells us that God had mercy on him because he did it in ignorance. All right. Godly wisdom is comprised of more than zeal and uh, conviction, as important as those elements are. Passion is kind of a trendy word that you hear a lot. And, and I'm not suggesting that all things that are trendy are, are bad by any means. But, but passion is a word that's often used, especially maybe among Christian leaders and everything, and that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. However, um, there, there needs to be more. I mean, passion without wisdom and direction might lead you just anywhere. And unfortunately, it has throughout human history. Hitler gets picked on a lot, and justly so. I don't know if you've ever seen one of those black and white films of Hitler preaching his gospel of racism and hatred. But man, that guy was convicted. Wasn't he? Passionate? I mean, the, the saliva is flying everywhere. He's just all so, like, super animated. And guess what? It worked for so many people. For Hitler youth who were so impressionable. This is the new and trendy thing. Every generation has new and trendy things. <laughs> And, uh, you know, this guy, 
He's just going to lead us the way we need to go. And that was, of course, a horrendous and satanic thing that was going on there. So people were passionate. They were in a frenzy. They had zeal. Boy, was it ever wrong. Wisdom implies a judicious weighing of information. Um, to, to sort of put it up to date nowadays, there, there are those who would suggest that you just sort of create your own gender. Not only that, it's the, the whole issue of sexuality. I don't care what flavor stripe you are. <laughs> um, is not an easy one for people. It's just not because I don't have to draw pictures or anything. It's just, you know, it's just a strong human impulse. So I don't want to sound like, oh, look, we're all big and bad and superior to others who, who struggle in different kinds of ways. However, we still got to go with God, with what God says. And he says, you know, what marriage is a man and a woman <laughs> together in marriage. Any other sexual relation outside of that, you know, including something that um, preachers and teachers can be at times a little hesitant to say, but that includes premarital sex, um, the, the whole package. And so um, we just want to, you know, we want to be loving and kind. We want to make sure that people understand that those, whatever those kinds, in general terms, of sins involve, hey, you're just as cleansed as anybody else who is a Christian through the blood of Christ. There are no limitations on, on that kind of thing. However, we, we have to point out, regardless of the trendiness today, that here it is. Here it is. And it kind of needs to be said because I'm not, not sure it's being said, hopefully in the right spirit. Hopefully I've had the right spirit. But I want to I wanna, you know, communicate that. We need to stick with what the scripture says. Because it's God's will. And uh, there, there's so many messed up relationships because people just don't go according to what, uh, what God says. All right. Number six, don't unnecessarily or artificially restrict the will of God. Sometimes, but not always, God gives us more than one option. I like to use the imagery there of, uh, so we don't have to beat ourselves up. It's kind of like the socks thing, you know. Uh, what color socks am I? I like to use image, imagery of a giant umbrella. You know, that encompasses who knows how much room, say, this entire realm, a giant umbrella. You have movement within that umbrella of God's will. You don't have to, you know, it, it's not a sin because you're here under the umbrella, but you've got this freedom to go and do a whole lot of different things. There's a fair amount like that, I think, in life. Now, um, we, we might almost prefer at times <laughs> to, to have more definitive direction. I think God may often grant us an uncomfortable amount of liberty in making decisions. Uh, maybe we prefer he limit our choices. Life, I suppose, would be easier in some sense in that way. But would it really be in our best interest if that were the case? We understand it. When we were five years old and, and we, uh, we go to some smorgasbord or, or something along those kind of lies, lines, and um, we got all these different kind of foods here, and mom picked out what we were going to have. We get that. But as adults, <laughs> you know, uh, not only do we want to pick out our own food, but it would be weird if we sort of didn't. So God does give us a responsibility to, uh, to have a variety of choices. And certainly a lot of that's fine. Um, he does give us a lot of choices that fall within the enlarged sphere or the umbrella of his will. Number seven, make sure that you strive to be faithful and discerning in the more important matters. For example, in the great scheme of things, I think it's far less important that we grasp all the nuances of end times uh, prophecy than it is that we treat our brothers and sisters in Christ here well. Or that we treat our family members as well. So we want to try to have the kind of priorities that God sets out for us. He does say pretty clearly, Jesus said, love God, love each other. And we just want to keep kind of going back to that because it's easy to get fairly sidetracked there, I think. Um, it's not really beneficial to major and minors when trying to understand what God wants me to do. Um, so, you know, there's the guy who's puffing on a cigarette and he's uh, expressing concern about, you know, 
going to get cancer or something like that. So he's, he's actually kind of concerned about his health while he's in bed with someone who is not his wife. Um, I think that guy probably's priorities is probably not exactly what it needs to be. And uh, so we want to have the kind of priorities that the scripture set forth. Number eight, don't despair over difficulties. Rather, have joy for the final results, perseverance, and maturity of faith, according to the James passage. Uh, what does God want you to do? Well, in the context of suffering, and this is not something I enjoy saying, but boy, it sure is real. Again, we talked about matching up with reality. God may want, in some sense, you to suffer. I mean, I don't mean want like desire per se, but it may be his will that you suffer. Um, it, it, man, it's hard to read the scriptures <laughs> and not realize that. Jesus warned on more than one occasion about persecution for his sake. He didn't say, you know what? If you love me and serve me really well, I'm going to get you out of all these jams in life. I didn't say that. I wish he would at times. <laughs> but when you see what happened to Jesus himself, when you see what happened to the apostles, uh, clearly there are occasions where suffering, or at least not removing the suffering, is according to the will of God. Paul had that thorn in the flesh, remember? Prayed about it three times. God just didn't take it away. And sometimes these reasons are only known by him. And that makes it tough on us, too. Because why? We'd like to know why. We just don't, we don't we're not omniscient. We, don't, we just don't and can't have all the insight that God has. And this clearly is when the trust comes in for these kinds of things. Um, it's... Uh, Frustrating to me when there's so much out there, and that's why I have to say these sort of dark things, because they're biblical. And it's frustrating to me when there's so much out there, perpetually out there, from some TV evangelists and others who would suggest that if you are just faithful enough, things are going to be great for you. Yeah, you just got to be faithful enough. You got to trust. Don't give up hope. So I just came across yesterday this book, Your Greater is Coming. And the subtitle is, Discover the Path to Your Bigger, Better, and Brighter Future. And, and, and this is from, the, uh, from product information. Okay. Your greater is coming, greater joy, greater strength, greater relationships, greater opportunities, greater success, <coughs> greater peace are all yours. Don't give up. Just as you're about to discover a new level of increase, ease, and joy. Well, there you go. You know what? That is true for the next life. <laughs> and it's absolutely false for most people most of the time in this world. And there's no way you could preach this with a straight face and hope to avoid getting stoned from the congregation in places like Ukraine, communist China, the poor people of Haiti, I mean, there's so much of this world that this, this is almost only in America could you pull this off and get all kind, millions of people buying and believing this kind of thing. I wish it were true. I wish you the best. God does bless. Keep asking for blessings. Keep praying for healing. God does that kind of thing. He just doesn't give the guarantee. Lazarus had to die again. Right? Right? So the, the healing that we need most is the eternal healing, the blood of Christ, by far. All right. Uh, finally, number nine, trust God. Act like a kid. I'm not getting, talking about a kid that's acting up. I'm talking about the, the kind of kid that uh, Jesus was talking about, you know, that... Um, Kids can be very trusting, and it's a beautiful thing when they are. And they often are, especially when they're younger. Um, probably all of us can remember, like, maybe by the pool or something, or even in the yard, your, your kid falls backwards into your arms, 
They are utterly trusting that you're going to catch them, and you do. Unless you're a satanic father, and I don't think there are any, any of those here, or mother. So, so trust God. Um, trust God to supply you with the necessary wisdom to ascertain his will for you. Trust God because according to verse 5 in the James passage, he gives generously to all without finding fault. God is for you. He's not going to ridicule you for not having all the answers. He's not going to get exasperated with you uh, because you keep coming back to him for wisdom. Trust God's character. Trust who he is. And we don't need to doubt his character and his ability to grant you that wisdom. That's the doubting, I believe, that's being talked about here. It's not that we never have doubts in life. But the last thing we want to do is doubt the character of God, the intentions of God, the holiness of God, the love of God for us. We don't. We should, we should not doubt that. That gets us in a, in a bind. So I do, I do pray that, that God will bless, uh, continue to bless all of us and, uh, and that we will grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'd like to ask the uh, worship team to, to come up at this time. And we'll have a, uh, a concluding song here. It is never, I mean, I don't know you from Adam. You don't know me from Adam. <laughs> Maybe a little bit more because you just heard it. But, but not much. Um, but it's, it's, it's never a bad time. Speaking of wisdom, it's never a bad time to come to Christ. I mean, if you're, if you're ready, if you're convinced that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and if you're ready to give your life to him, this is, this is the time. This is the time to do it. And uh, I probably won't, you know, I'd be glad, I can do the theology, but since I don't know you, it would probably be someone else in the church who would sort of, you know, counsel you and, and, and tell you the kind of things that are involved in that. But... Um, but I would highly recommend that uh, if anyone here is ready to make a decision, that you just go ahead and do it. I think, I think Mark would probably do cartwheels when he finds out that, that someone did. And you may want to see him do that. Uh, so, um, yeah. Um, go to the wisdom of God. Surrender your life to God if you have. Um, and that's what comes through time and time again in his word. Please stand. Worthy of every song you could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring.
where you want to go, and who you want to be, Lord.